exercise were seen as a waste of time. The neuroplasticians, as I called the scientists who demonstrated that the brain is plastic, refuted the doctrine of the unchanging brain. Equipped for the first time with the tools to observe the living brain's microscopic activities, they showed that it changes as it works. In 2000, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded for demonstrating that as learning occurs, the connections amongst nerve cells increase. The scientist behind that discovery, Eric Kandel, also showed that learning can switch on genes that change neural structure. Hundreds of studies went on to demonstrate that mental activity is not only the product of the brain, but also a shaper of it. Neuroplasticity restored the mind to its rightful place in modern medicine and human life. The intellectual revolution described in The Brain That Changes Itself was the beginning. Now, in this book, I tell of the astounding advances of a second generation of neuroplasticians who, because they did not have the burden of proving the existence of plasticity, have been liberated to devote themselves to understanding and using plasticity's extraordinary power. I've traveled to five continents to meet with them, the scientists, clinicians, and their patients, in order to learn their stories. Some of these scientists work in the cutting-edge neuroscience labs of the Western world. Others are clinicians who have applied that science, and still others are clinicians and patients who together stumbled upon neuroplasticity and perfected effective treatment techniques even before plasticity had been demonstrated in the lab. One patient after another in this book had been told they would never get better. For decades, the term healing was seldom used in connection with the brain as it was with other organ systems, such as the skin or the bones or the digestive tract. While organs such as the skin, liver, and blood could repair themselves by replenishing their lost cells using stem cells to function as replacement parts, no such cells were found in the brain, despite decades of searching. Once neurons were lost, no evidence could be found that they were ever replaced. Scientists tried to find ways to explain this in evolutionary terms. In the course of evolving into an organ with millions of highly specialized circuits, the brain simply lost the ability to supply those circuits with replacement parts. Even if neuronal stem cells, baby neurons, were to be found, how, it was wondered, would they be of any help? How would they ever integrate into the sophisticated but dizzyingly complex circuits of the brain? Because it wasn't thought possible to heal the brain, most treatments use medication to prop up the failing system and decrease symptoms by temporarily changing the chemical balance in the brain. But stop the medication and the symptoms would return. It turns out that the brain is not too sophisticated for its own good after all. This book will show how this very sophistication, which involves brain cells being able to constantly communicate electrically with one another and to form and reform new connections moment by moment, is the source of a unique kind of healing. True, in the course of specializing, important reparative abilities available to other organs were lost, but others were gained, and they are mostly expressions of the brain's plasticity. Each of the stories in this book will illustrate a different facet of these neuroplastic ways of healing. The more I immersed myself in these different kinds of healing, the more I began to make distinctions among them and to see that some of the approaches targeted different stages of the healing process. I have proposed, in Chapter 3, a first model of the stages of neuroplastic healing to help the reader see how they all fit together. Just as the discoveries of medication and surgery led to therapies to relieve a staggering number of conditions, so does the discovery of neuroplasticity. The reader will find cases, many very detailed, that may be relevant to someone who has or cares for someone who has experienced chronic pain, stroke, traumatic brain injury, brain damage, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, attention deficit disorder, a learning disorder, including dyslexia, a sensory processing disorder, a developmental delay, or a part.